to get this show out, um, all the people that showed up. This is great. Um, so I guess we'll just start with a, a few remarks from our principal, Mr. Schaefer, before we get started. Well, thank you, Ben. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming tonight. So this is our first Liberty Lecture of the Year, and we have a few more scheduled. Uh, I don't have the dates offhand. The next one's in January, so we've got a little bit of time. So uh, watch Monday Notes or... Um, or we'll just communicate by Facebook and social media and any other way that we can uh, for, uh, for the next one that, that's coming up. Um, we try to do a few of these a year so, so that uh, we have an opportunity to focus on some academic issues that are of interest for our students and families and uh, supporters and friends and others who have heard about the school just to bring people here after hours and, and just uh, continue the academic discussion that we, uh, that we uh, try to maintain throughout the course of the day, throughout the year, through into the summer, and, and on an ongoing basis. And so uh, uh, we're really fortunate to have Dr. Wolfram here. Uh, he and I have become friends over the years through a, a different organization that I'm a part of, Leadership Program of the Rockies. I see a few people who are from LPR in the audience here as well. And so Dr. Wolfram is going to be uh, visiting with us for his annual appearance at LPR tomorrow, but it's uh, great that he came a little early and was able to come up here to Fort Collins and spend some time uh, with, uh, with all of us here. So uh, um, once we had Dr. Wolfram coming and we had the date picked out, I sent out a request for students to help organize the evening and send out invitations and urge uh, their, their fellow students to attend. And we just had a little gathering upstairs with Dr. Wolfram and about 10, what, 10 12 then students, would you say, uh, showed up at that meeting and everybody took a little piece of of the organizational duties and details, and so uh, it's really students who put this event on for us this evening. So, uh, um, you know, thanks everyone uh, for, for attending. Uh, I'd like to point out Derek Anderson is uh, here from representing Ridgeview, and he's the principal over at Ridgeview, so we're glad to have our Ridgeview friends joining us here tonight as well. And, um, let's see. Um, Oh, oh, Casey Churchill, principal of our elementary school, is here as well. And Paula Hanson is our <laughs> Paula Hanson is chairman of our board of directors. Uh, it's the board of uh, seven board members, parents who are in charge of the school and, and run our school. So Paula, thank you, and, uh, and uh, other board members for being here as well. And thank you again for yeah. getting things started. Cool. So now it is my pleasure to introduce um, Mr. Wolfram. So. Uh, just reading through this, he is definitely a well-rounded man. Uh, so, he is currently the Professor of Economics at Hillsdale College, um, a very renowned college, and um, one that I think is really high on the list for even me. Um, so, he's not only just economics though, but he specializes in taxation and policy analysis. Um, and he also has served on the Board of Education from 1993 to 1999 of Michigan. Um, so kind of all over the place, which uh, gives him a lot of experience and background. Um, his public policy experience includes serving as Congressman Nick Smith's Chief of Staff, um, Michigan's Deputy of State Treasurer for Taxation and Economic Policy um, under John Eckler, and Senior Economist to the Republican Senate in Michigan. So not only teaching, but politics. This man is truly wonderful. So, uh, he is truly <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> so as far as his education goes, he um, graduated summa cum laude from the University of California in Santa Barbara, and then he got his graduate, uh, or his, uh, wait, uh, one second, he received his uh, PhD, or PhD, and from the University of California in Berkeley. So, um, and then from there he went on to teach at some other colleges, but ultimately ended up at Hillsdale. Um, his most recent book, and one that he uh, recommended himself, was A Capitalist Manifesto, which, um, coming from him, I guess I'll have to read now. So, uh, <laughs> well, I guess I'll close with, um, Michigan Runner Magazine also named him one of the top 25 runners in Michigan of the past 25 years. So he is a runner, not just an economist, or a politician. He knows how to run. Yeah, on the, on the last part, um, I tell my running friends that I used to be Gary Wolfram. Now I'm just what's left of Gary Wolfram. Um, 
But uh, what I wanted to talk about today is a little bit about economic trends and how they interact with the public policy arena and how they end up with the political process. Um, first of all, in 1850, Frederick Bastiat, who uh, Frederick Bastiat wrote a book called The Law. And in it, he said, a science of economics has to become logically prior to a science of politics. And that's because we have to figure out if people interacting according to their own plan is going to work out in social harmony, or is that going to work out as sort of a disaster? If it's going to work out well, then there won't be as much of a need for government. If it's going to turn out to rather poorly, then it's going to need a much stronger role for government. So the idea is what we ought to do before we figure out what the role of government might be or how we might form our government, what we ought to do is figure out how does the economic system work. And in particular, the economic system that we have in the United States today or we're trying to retain in the United States today is that of market capitalism. And so what, uh, what I've basically said is that what you need to do is to have a study of economics so that you know what the political philosophy is that you that is consistent with that. In fact, um, Ludwig von Mises in uh, 1927 um, wrote a book called Liberalism in the Classical Tradition. Uh, and again, you can get that. You can get Bastiat's The Law free from the uh, you know from the internet. Uh, get them, Bastiat's there's a Frederick Bastiat Society website. And all of Ludwig von Mises' books are uh, available on Mises.org. Um, actually, when I think about it, this guy should be paying me to plug their, plug their organizations. But, um, but in particular, uh, Liberalism in the Classical Tradition, I have my students read in an introductory class. Uh, and why is that? It's because he pointed out that the market process is the only process that can create wealth for the masses. And um, so, the, so why, why does the market process do that? Well, first of all, what you have to do is to realize that the market is based on voluntary exchange. If you, if you go to the Walmart, uh, they don't start throwing stuff in your cart and then make you pay for it on the way out. Nor do you get to just throw everything you want in the cart and get the checkout line and say, well, I'll give you $5 for it, right? Mr. Walmart will say, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. You've got to give us more. Otherwise, you don't get to walk out the door. And, I don't know about Fort Collins, but in Hillsdale, uh, there are not vans to go around and grab people and bring them up to the Walmart and chain them behind the checkout counter. Everybody that's there, whether they're buying something, or whether they're behind the checkout counter, what are they doing? But they're because they volunteered to do it. Why? Because they got something in exchange. And that's what Adam Smith talks about in Wealth of Nations. You know, it says, uh, you give me what I want and I will give you what you want. And, and, and that is what the better part of our, uh, our needs are satisfied. So everybody that walks out of the Walmart into the parking lot was better off than when they walked in. Which is why the smiley face is their, is their symbol, right? If you walked out of the Walmart after going shopping there, and you came out and said, oh my gosh, I can't, this is just terrible, what happened to me? Why in the world did you buy this stuff, right? You must have, you must have been happier than when you walked in, otherwise you wouldn't have paid them for it. And the person behind the checkout counter is there because they're willing to trade their time for whatever Mr. Walmart's given them. So that's true of any exchange in market capitalism. Market capitalism is a system based on voluntary exchange. Now, the second thing is that, let's say I'm going to make something. If I'm going to make something, where do I get the resources to make that? i got to get it from somebody that wants to give it to me, right? And how am I going to give, what, what do they need for me to give it, uh, to, give it to me? If you're going to give me your labor, their labor, I have to pay you at least what you could have made somewhere else, or at least what you thought the value of your time was somewhere else. Otherwise, I can't get you. I can't just seize you away. If I'm going to use your steel, uh, and I'm going to build, build cars and I need steel, how do I get that steel? I got to pay uh, Dynamic Steel or 
uh, you know, U.S. steel or whatever it is, I got to pay them the value of that steel that they could have got somewhere else. Everything that you get to operate a business, you have to pay the resources their value in the next best thing they could have done. Okay? If you're not paying them the value of the next best thing they could have done, you don't get them. Then what do you have to do? Then you have to turn around and make something that consumers value more, or you go out of business. How many in here have ever run a business? A little business, small business. Yeah. Well, you know the deal, right? You don't get to lose money in every unit and make it up in volume. Okay? Doesn't work that way. If you're using up resources worth $100 and you're only making stuff that people want to pay $90 for, you go bankrupt. You don't get to hang around forever. Ask the old General Motors, okay? Pan American Airlines. Kmart, who knows? Um, but, so what does that tell you? It tells you that this is this market system, what does it do? It says, in order, in order to get any resources, I have to do what? I have to make something that consumers value even more than whatever else they could have done. How could that not be the most efficient way of meeting the demands of consumers? Just the logic of that, right? It is, that you can't imagine another system that would do it that way, right? That could do it better. Because I have to make something you guys value more than the next best thing that any of those resources uh, could have put together. So why can't central planning work? Which is really sort of the alternative, right? The alternative is you don't get to act according to your own plan and do things voluntarily. The government, if you want to look at socialism, the government owns the property and directs, here's what you're going to do, here's what we're going to make. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember the Soviet Union, uh, you know, they had five-year plans, uh, and they made whatever the, the central planners want, and you have to accept it, whether it's the type of clothing you have, or whether it's the, the apartment that you're living in, okay? But here's the problem. How did they know how to create an incentive for you to innovate? How do I get you to work hard? How do I get you to take on the risk of innovation? Because innovation requires risk taking. It's not innovative to do something everybody knows what to do, right? It's innovative to do something that nobody's done before. If nobody's done before, you don't know it's going to work out, right? You know, three out of every four all small businesses fail within five years. People, people fail all the time, right? And you've got to take a risk in order to come up with something new. What is, you know, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, what did they do? They dropped out of, out of quality colleges, universities, to take on a risk that you guys were going to want cell phones that you can uh, take pictures with, uh, or you're going to want, you know, software to make it so that your computer uh, doesn't have to be carried around by a truck, okay? So, how do I get people to innovate? Well, in the market, we get people to innovate by what? By profit, okay? The profit mechanism. If you're, uh, you know, Zuckerberg, and you invent Facebook, uh, and people like it, and lots of people use it, then what happens? You get really wealthy. And if instead, you invent my empty space, I call it my space, not called my empty space, right? Some of you don't even remember my space because you're too young. Well, for a while, there was a thing called my space, right? They didn't make any money, or they're gone. So it takes a risk to innovate, so how am I going to get that, how am I going to uh, get you to innovate? In the market, we get you to innovate by the profit mechanism. And if you sort of think about profit, what is that profit? As I was saying earlier, if you take resources worth X, make something that consumers value as 100 plus X, you make profit. So if you showed me a company that made a billion dollars in profit last year, we'd all celebrate, right? We'd say, oh my gosh, this company made, took resources worth X and they made stuff that we valued at X plus a billion dollars. So what we ought to do is we ought to salute companies that are very profitable. Unfortunately, Congress sometimes will hold hearings for companies that are very profitable 
and try to imply that the only way they got profitable was to do something dastardly. But the reality is, the only way you get profitable in a market-based system is to create something that somebody wants, create, to create value which is greater than what could have been done before. So, in the Soviet Union, why is it that you had a country with a third of the world's resources where you couldn't get a bowl of cornflakes? At least not sugar-coated cornflakes. Um, because they didn't have incentives to innovate. The second, but the, the most important aspect of why it doesn't work is because the information problem, which is what Ludwig von Mises talked about and Friedrich Hayek talked about and won the Nobel Prize in 1974. Um, what was, what's the decentralized, decentralized information problem? It's that you guys know how much toilet paper you're gonna want next week. You guys know whether you like you know, roasted peanuts or honey roasted peanuts. How in the world can a central planner do that? How in the world can a central planner know whether they've got big data, no matter what the size of the computer, they can't possibly know how much, you know, a honey roasted peanuts we're gonna want in every retail outlet in America at every moment in time. Can't possibly know that, right? And so, that's why centrally planned governments always fail. They certainly fail to produce wealth for the masses because they can't allocate resources efficiently. They don't know, should I be putting the oil into diesel fuel number two, or should I be making pla plastics with it, or should I be making it into to kerosene or diesel fuel or whatever, right? They can't possibly know that. And so that's why you don't see centrally planned economies that are wealthy, that at least that the poor are wealthy. There'll be wealthy people there, but how do they get wealthy? They got wealthy through the governmental process, right? They got wealthy through the governmental process. They didn't get wealthy by pleasing other people. Vladimir Putin, you know, his oligarchs, uh, they didn't get wealthy by pleasing other people. They got wealthy because there's barriers to entry into their markets. They are an economic problem, but nobody can, can jump into that market. So the, the central planned system can't solve that information problem no matter what. Which is why, if you look at any centrally planned system, what happens? They've got to be authoritarian. They have to be. Because if you guys act according to your own plan, it's not going to work out. The central plan is not going to work out. I have this vision of you guys, and you're all supposed to be driving electric cars, and you won't do it. So what do I have to do? I have to require that if you drive a gasoline car, it's got to get 3,000 miles to the gallon. Okay? So the, the, if you guys are just running around acting according to your own plan, what well, you do? You'll buy you know, Dodge Ram pickup trucks and Ford F-150s and drive around in it. But that isn't what my plan is. So all of a sudden, anybody that's got a centrally planned system, what will you have? You'll have an authoritarian government. You have to have that. Because it has to be able to command you and tell you, here's what you do, here's what's going to be made. Now, I think it's sort of an interesting thing to um, look back at this book I was talking about. Mises, Mises wrote this book, Classical Liberalism. He wrote it in 1927. That's the roaring 20s, right? Everything's going on. We have the, we have the Great War, right? They didn't call it World War I when it started. So, oh my gosh, this is because we'll have another one down the road, right? We'll just call this World War I, right? It was, it was the Great War, the war to end all wars. 1927, what does Mises say on page three? He says, whoever does not deliberately close his eyes to the facts will see the, impen the impending economic, cl cl economic collapse of the world and, a, a, and a, a decline in the world civilization. He then go he goes on to basically say, look, we're gonna have the Great Depression, we're going to have World War II. The fascists are going to start World War II, and they're not going to win. All written in 1927. He says, "Why is this going to happen? Why are we going to have? Why are we going to have the Great Depression? Why are we going to have World War II?" He doesn't say it's because the Federal Reserve is printing too much money, or he doesn't say that we don't have a flat tax. He says that anti-liberal thought is what's going to cause that. And what he meant by that is, in those days. Liberal meant limited government, free markets, 
That, that is what the philosophy was. And he, what, what was going on in the 1920s, right? You were kept, you had the rise of fascism in, uh, in Germany and in Spain, and you had the rise of, uh, the, of socialism in, uh, in Russia and in Great Britain, and you had progressivism in the United States. All these political thoughts, political philosophies, that were based on, we need a government authority to make things right. And his argument was, can't possibly work. Can't possibly work. And, of course, nobody read the book. So we had World War II, uh, and we, you know, we had the, you know, the, the Great Depression. But, you know, the people that read that and said, oh my gosh, maybe he's right. What do you need to have, uh, have uh, uh, a market system work? What do you need to have the only system that can create wealth for the masses work? You need to have a belief in limited government. You have to believe that the role of government is to protect life, liberty, and property. Mises is, is very clear. He says, you know, classical liberals are not anarchists. There is a role for government. But what is that role? That role is limited to the protection of life, liberty, and property. Because once government goes beyond that, and it starts telling you, here's what you have to make, here's what you have to buy, here's how you have to make it, then what happens? You end up with central planning. He talks about what he calls interventionism, right? He says, well, we've got central planning over here, we've got uh, market capitalism over here. What about the sort of midpoint? He says, the problem with that is, once government intervenes, it causes unintended consequences. And that leads to further government intervention. And that leads to more unintended consequences. And that leads to further government intervention. And so what you end up with, eventually just keep moving towards central planning. I mean, let's take a look at just a very simple case. Um, World War II, what did they do? They set wage and price controls in World War II. Okay? Um, and why? Because they were worried that they had drafted all sorts of folks uh, and they needed uh, people to work uh, in the, uh, the factories to build the planes and tanks and everything else. Okay? And um, so, but wages were going to rise if they did that. So they said, no, we're going to cap what wages are because we know, as the government, we know that this wage is going to be too high, so it can't, it can't go higher. Well, markets do, in fact, work. Um, the companies that were making uh, the tanks and planes and, uh, you know, ships, what did they say? Well, we got to figure out a way to get labor, so what do we do? How about if we give you health insurance as part of your package, right? We'll give you health insurance as part of your package. Well, there was a court case that ruled that that didn't count against the wage and price controls. So now what happens? Now what happens is people now have a health insurance, okay? And uh, as they start getting health insurance, um, what, what, after the wage and price controls fall off, why did, the, why did the health insurance stay there? Because it doesn't count as what? It doesn't count as income. If you've ever you know, worked with somebody and they provide your health insurance, you don't have to pay income on that, do you? Right? It's not included on your W-2. So, what does that mean? Marginal tax rates uh, before the Reagan administration were 70%. So it says if I give you a dollar in income and you go out and buy your health insurance with it, Guess what? You can only have 30 cents to go buy your health insurance. But if I give it to you here, you can buy, I can buy you a dollar for the health insurance if I buy it as the employer. You know, I tell my students, I said, look, when you guys go out to get a job, are you going to ask for what the benefits are as well as the wage? And they go, oh, yeah. And I say, are you going to ask them, um, are they going to pay your car insurance? Are they going to pay your fire insurance? Okay. Why aren't they going to pay your fire insurance, your car insurance, your property theft insurance? Why is it that they only do health insurance? It's because Moses came down with it on the tablet. Okay? No, there's got to be some reason that happened. Why in the world is it just health insurance to tie to your job? It's because of the wage and price controls. So then what happens? Now, you have insurance, so when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, gee, you need a blood test, you don't say, oh, should I get it over here at Walmart or should I get it at Rite Aid over here? It might cost, it might be cheaper to do a Rite Aid. So, oh, no, we can do it right here. Of 
course, it costs $50 more, but do I care? Heck no. The insurance company pays for it, right? So what happens? The demand for health insurance, the demand for health services goes up and up and up. So we started getting these increases in the price. Of, now, now here's a problem. If I, if I don't have insurance, then how am I going to make all these high payments for all the health care that's going up in price? Who are the two main groups that don't have health insurance for their employer? One is people who are over 65. So in 1965, what do we do? The government creates a health insurance company called Medicare. And the people who aren't working, so the government makes another health insurance company called Medicaid. So now you have even more people out there that are out there bidding up the price of health care, right? So now what happens? We go, oh my gosh, healthcare services are going through the roof. We got all these unemployed people. Excuse me, uninsured people. Now what happens? You lose your job and you have diabetes. Okay? Now, if you lose your job, can you still keep your car insurance? Yeah. Can you still keep your life insurance? Yeah. Can you keep your fire insurance? Yeah. Can you keep your health insurance? No. So now you go in and you say, well, gee, I'm going to go out and buy it in the private sector. You walk in and say, hey, you know, I'd like to buy some health insurance. They say, you got diabetes. I'm not going to treat your kids that. You already got it. Right? That's like, look, like, so, so what did we do? We said, oh my gosh, we better make it against the law for you to be denied coverage for an existing condition, which is the Affordable Care Act does, right? Think about what kind of insurance is that? What if life insurance worked that way? Your aunt dies, you go and say, I want $100,000 on life insurance, my aunt. She's dead. Yeah, that's a pre existing condition, right? You can't <laughs> So it can't possibly be insurance. But here's the problem. If you can't deny me for a pre-existing condition, when will I buy insurance? Only when I get sick. So what's going to happen? Your insurance company's going out of business. So what do we have to do? We have to make everybody get insurance, don't we? We have to have the employers give you insurance, and we have to make you buy insurance, and if you don't buy insurance, we're going to tax you. So how do we get to a 2300 page Affordable Care Act? Wage and price controls in World War II, okay? So what happens, Mises is right, right? What happens is the government keeps getting more and more and more and more involved in health. And think about this, what kind of insurance do you get to buy? You get to buy the insurance that you want? No, you gotta have either a bronze plan, a silver plan, a platinum plan, a gold plan, or a platinum plan. And they're going to tell you what's in those plans. Then if not in those plans, then what? That makes the standard. So now what's happened? What's happened is, you guys don't get to choose the insurance that you want. Who chooses it? The government chooses it. And think of how tied in the government is in, health, in, 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 in the healthcare industry. Right? Go, to, go to a doctor and say, hey, can you do this? Well, i got to look up 1,500 pages of stuff to see if I can do that or not, right? And so Mises is it's correct that once the government intervenes, it's going to cause continual government intervention. And so what does that tell us? We've got to be very careful about what the role of government is, right? And what's the role of government? Why? It's to protect life, liberty, and property. Mises says we're not anarchists. We need government. Why do we need government? We need government because otherwise the strong will prey upon the weak. If you don't have any government, then what will happen? You won't have property rights. If you don't have property rights, then what will happen? It will be very hard to, I mean all you can do is look at the city of Detroit. 1.9 million people in 1950, 680,000 people today. What happened? Government couldn't protect property rights. Okay. When did it start? When, when uh, you had the, uh, the, the riots in 1967. And so what did that declare? Watch it on television. It's, oh my gosh, the government can't protect property rights. I'm getting out of here. So you need the government to protect property rights. But that's all you need it to do. Once you have it doing something else, it's going to lead to all those things that we were just talking about. And when the government does it, what does that mean? They're going to decide. Right? 
They're going to decide. So let's just sort of think uh, about how does this work? Does it indeed create wealth for the masses? Right? Think about this. Uh, Robert Rector from the Heritage Institute has done uh, at least three studies where he surveyed people that were uh, qualified um, as poor under the uh, uh, Bureau, uh, Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics uh, uh, analysis. So they meet the standard of what's poverty in the United States. 40% um, of all poor people in the United States own their own home. And on average, it's a three-bedroom home with one and a half baths. 80% um, have air conditioning. Now, I grew up in Fresno, okay? Have you ever been to Fresno? Really? There's a lot of people who have been to Fresno. Um, well, one thing you know about Fresno is what? It's hot, right? It's, you know, I took, my, uh, I took my youngest son out there a couple summers ago, uh, and it was 116 degrees, and he had never been anywhere. I mean, we grew up in Michigan, right? Grows up in Michigan. It's never 116. It's a 90. It's a problem. Um, so, but when I grew up, nobody had air conditioning. We had a thing called a swamp cooler, where you, you cut a hole in your roof, and you put a pan of water there, and you put a fan on the top, and you hot human air through your house, and pretended that you were cooled off. Okay? I didn't know anybody had air conditioning. Today, 80% of all poor households in the United States have air conditioning. 97% of a color television. Two-thirds have more than two rooms per person. Okay? The average poor person in the United States has more living space than the average a wealthy person in France, or in Germany, or anywhere in Europe. And, and if you look at what, what poverty, there was an article in The Economist a number of years ago um, on, it was called A Flourishing Slum, it's about India, and India's making the transition to market economy. But they were talking about well, what, what it means to live in Dubai in the slums. And they, they were just looking at a number of different families, and all, you know, for all of them, if half their family slept on their side, they could fit into their living space at night. And instead, if you're poor here, you got more than two rooms per person. Why is that? Because we have, have created a system pretty much based on market capitalism. I mean, we're moving away from there, but you know, how did we get here to start with? We got here through market capitalism, and that's, that's why there's so much wealth here. 1978, China, who's been a socialist, centrally planned state for decades, right? Well, actually, for centuries. 1978, they come along and they say, you know what? Mail's little red book is nice, but I'd rather have flat screen television. So, what they did was they created special enterprises, special economic zones, where they started using market capitalism in the, in the south uh, eastern provinces in China. And then what happened? It started working. And then they expanded it. And between 1980 and 2015, 800 million people have moved out of poverty in China. Why did that happen? It didn't happen until all of a sudden the Chinese got smarter, right? It didn't happen until all of a sudden the Chinese started working harder. It got that way because they changed the system by which they organized themselves. They're moving towards market capitalism. What happened in India? Same thing, right? They don't start until 1992, but what's happening in India? Growth rates of 7, 8, 9% GDP, okay? So what's going on there? You must have seen slumdog millionaires, right? Well, you know, 1980, there would have been slumdog slumdogs, okay? There's no millionaires. So how do you, so, you know, why does this happen? Uh, it's because that, um, because, why are we moving in the wrong direction? It's because people see but they don't observe. I was just, you know, talking to some of the high school students uh, earlier today um, uh, down at the Vanguard School. Um, and, and tell a Sherlock Holmes story, right? In Scandal of Bohemia, this is the first Sherlock Holmes story, what happens is um, Sherlock's up in, the, in his uh, room up there and Watson's walking by, sees him in the window, so he decides to walk up there, walks up the stairs, knocks on the door, Sherlock has him in for a while, uh, and then Sherlock says, Watson, how many steps are there coming up from the ground floor? And Watson says, geez, I don't know. Sherlock says, well, how many times have you walked up and down these steps? I'm like, hundreds of times. He says, Watson, there are 17 steps coming up from the ground floor. The problem with you, Watson, is you see, but you do not observe. 
And that's why we get the public policy that we do. We see the wealthy, we see that we're wealthy, but if we don't observe how the heck we got here, we think that we can still retain the wealth that we have and have government intervention. And the reality is, you can't, right? Now, doesn't mean we're gonna collapse. Um, Adam Smith in Wealth of Nations has a, has a really nice quote where he, I don't have the exact quote with me, but he says, um, basically, that the power of, because uh, market capitalism is starting there, right? Like in 1750, he's writing 1776, he's explaining what, what was going on, is the power of individual liberty and for markets is so powerful a force, that he says, it can, um, uh, it can overcome the hundreds of encumbrances with which the fall of human laws imposes on it. Then he goes on to say that we, we, we would be wealthier if it weren't for that, but nonetheless, it can overcome lots of stuff. And you know what? You know, the healthcare system isn't going to collapse because there's these hundreds of, uh, of encumbrances put upon it. The market will figure out a way to deal with it. Now, we'll all be less wealthy, and we'll all have less choice of what we're going to do, but the market's so powerful that it will, it, it will, it will take care of that. Now, how do you get people to observe, though? That's the important thing, right? you got to get people to observe. Um, what we want is public policy that's going to create wealth for the masses. So let's think about what we need to, to, to talk to people about. Let's observe, where do you want to be poor, okay? Do you want to be, I suppose I've got to say, you know, you can, you can uh, live anywhere you want, you can be born in any country you want, but you're going to be the poorest person there. You're going to say, oh yeah, I want to be the poorest person in Venezuela, right? I want to be the poorest person in North Korea, I want to be the poorest person in Cuba, I want to be the poorest person in Democratic Republic of Congo. No. You want to be the poorest person in Hong Kong or Singapore or the United States or Canada, Switzerland, right? You want to be places that are in the market economy. In fact, if you look at, there's an index of economic freedom that uh, the Fraser Institute puts out, and if you look at the countries that are top 25% of economic freedom, the bottom 10% of the income distribution is 11 times wealthier than if you're in the bottom 25% of countries with uh, economic freedom. And just, if you just, uh, it, you know, I tell my students, look, you know, this isn't rocket surgery, okay? All you gotta do is you gotta look and say, hey, where do you wanna be poor, right? You wanna be poor someplace that's got market capitalism. That indeed should tell you. Or I ask my students, I say, you know, what would you rather be, king of England in 1263 or yourself? Well, gee, I'd like to have toilet paper, and I'd like to have, you know, running water, and I'd like to have electricity, and, like have my cell phone, you know. I'd rather be here, right? King of England didn't have fork, okay? Why was that? Because he was in the feudal system. The way they organized themselves wasn't market capitalism. It doesn't show up till about the middle of the 18th century. Now nobody invented it, right? What happened was we had what Hayek calls social evolution. We went to feudalism, to mercantilism, to market capitalism, okay? But we, that's where we are now. And we have the benefit of having been in a, in a place where that has been the tradition. But if you want to, if you just, you know, if you look historically, you know you don't want to live in some place that was pre-market capitalist. Even if you were the king, you wouldn't want 